Hello everyone, welcome to Pass Summit 2020. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Toyob. I'll be talking about Think Like the Cardinality Estimator. Before I start my session, there are some housekeeping slides that are provided by Pass I want to talk about. If you want to keep yourself engaged beyond Pass Summit 2020, there are a few things that you can check out and especially I'll mention about the local user groups and SQL Saturdays. They are happening in your local area. Check those out. There are virtual groups that are uh, catered to you know different audience, different countries, different languages. Uh, also check those out. You can always get engaged uh, uh, with PASS as a volunteer. So go to PASS.org and uh, you can find more about these offerings. Please fill out uh, the session evaluation after this session. Uh, I know you have time till November 20th, uh, but uh, you know you get busy with other things, so it's uh, good if you can fill it up right away. That way you don't have to forget. And PASS is also uh, giving out some cool prizes uh, out of the uh, you know all the session evaluations that get submitted. So. I'm not going to talk about myself, what you see on the right side, you can read about it, but take a note of uh, how to get in touch with me. This is my LinkedIn and my Twitter handle. So if you have any question regarding this presentation, after the presentation is over, uh, you can always reach out to me or anything in general about uh, data platform. I'll try to answer it. If I do not know the answer, I can get in touch with people and uh, we'll get back to you with an answer. So let me talk a little bit about this session. Uh, I'm planning to talk about between 25 and 30 minutes, and then we'll move to the demo. Uh, demo will be another 30 minutes, and we have an exclusive Q&A at the end for 15 minutes. But during the presentation, at any point, if you have a question, please put it in the chat window. I'll be monitoring that, and I'll be answering your question live there. And I'm going to turn off my camera for now, uh, so you can get the you know full view of my slide and the demo. And I'll turn it on at the end uh, when we get to the get to the Q and A. So let's move on with the presentation. The first thing we'll be talking about is a couple of definitions before I dive into other topics. The first one is a predicate, and why we are talking about predicate. The cardinal estimator process is interesting. Uh, is interested in the predicates that we define in our statement. So we can define predicates in our join expressions. So here you can see we are joining between orders and customers table, and we are using customer ID as a join predicate. We can also use it in a filter. Uh, uh, as you can see in this example, we are using it in the where clause, also in the having after we're doing the group by. Now, cardinality estimator need to know how selective our predicates are, the predicates that we are using within our statement. So what is a predicate selectivity? It's the fraction of rows that qualifies from the input set based on the predicate uh, we are passing. And uh, I can, you know, I showed you the formula how to do this. And if we look at a uh, example, so in the sales order table, there are 73,595 records. If we pass a predicate as customer ID equals 577, we can see that the 75 rows get qualified. And if we divide 75 by 73,595, that's the uh, selectivity for this predicate. Now, this is important for us because based on the number of rows or, the, or, no, or based on the selectivity, uh, the cardinality estimator will make some choices, which we'll be seeing in the you know in, in in future slides and also in the demo. The next one is a density. So density is described uh, about a data set in a column. How unique the data set is, how often the duplicate occurs uh, in a column, and this is very important for us because many a times you will see during the demo. If we do not have an index on a column, the cardinality estimator cannot go to the histogram to estimate the number of rows that will qualify. And in those situations, it will actually uh, f revert to looking at the density 
of that column. And then, you know, Microsoft also hard coded a lot of values depending on the operator that you are passing. And it will do the calculations and come up with the estimated number of rows. Again, uh, once I show it to you in the demo, it will more, make more sense. So the density definitely, you know, it plays a huge role. And the way we calculate this is a one divided by the distinct values in a column. And the higher density means it's less unique, lower density means, um, you know, it's more unique rows. And if we want to see this in an example, here we can see that the, we have 663 distinct customer IDs out of the whole, uh, you know, in the order table. So if we do one divided by 663, uh, we get the density of this column. And you'll see when I show you the DBCC show statistics output, that this value is already pre-calculated and it comes in the output of, uh, of, of, of a statistics. Next, you know, we need to understand what's the cardinality estimation. So there are, if you go and, you know, look it up online, you will see many, many different definitions of, uh, of this. Uh, but, you know, I, as I put it here, for our purpose, for SQL or T-SQL, it's the number of rows that are written by a query operator. So each operator in a query plan has an estimated cardinality, the number of rows that is guessed by the uh, optimizer. And when I say guessed, it's really not guessed every time, right? If you have a histogram um, uh, uh, you know, of index, it knows how to calculate that. But there will be uh, cases that when we do not have a histogram, there Microsoft has hardcore numbers based on that it will do a calculation and come up with the estimate. But the reason it called estimate because there are many, you know, th there are a few reasons. Number one, we have large, large tables that we do not build statistics by scanning all the data set. We probably take a sample and based on that we create histogram. Another thing you have to remember in a histogram doesn't matter how big the table is, you only get 200 steps. So even if you have a 200 billion record um, row table or 200 million or 200,000, you only get 200 steps. So they are not accurate all the time. And so that's why we call this estimate. And then during the runtime, when it sees the actual number, that also get recorded in the actual execution plan. And we, like we, you know, we'll see that. So if we look at a, you know, an example here, this is a tool tip of an operator from execution plan, from actual execution plan. The reason I know that it's actual execution plan, as you can see that, uh, you know, in the screen, uh, you have actual number of rows and underneath you have estimated number of rows and I pointed those two out. Now, our goal or the ideal situation will be if our actual number and the estimated number matches, but do they happen all the time? No. And that's the reason of this talk for you to understand when you look at these numbers that why my actual number of rows are differing from my estimated number of rows. And of course, we'll always strive to make a match between these two, but that's not gonna happen. And I can tell you that based on my experience, you will see uh, many a times that's not gonna happen. There are many reasons that we'll be talking about. So if you know that, you know, why my numbers are not matching, and if you know that how the estimated numbers were created, maybe you can do something. One of the quick solution is to rebuild index. But again, if it's a huge table, you're probably not going to rebuild with a 100% sample. Uh, but at least you know that why they're differing, right? Once you know, you can make some adjustment. But if you do not know even where these numbers are coming from, uh, and you're trying to optimize a query, you will be really lost. So try to get the concept uh, of understanding where the estimated number of rows are coming from and why it's differing from the actual number of rows. So next we'll be talking about why cardinality matters. So when we submit a query to the SQL Server engine, what happens behind the scene? It goes through different phases. The first one is a parsing phase. What happened in the parsing phase? The query, it tests that if it can parse the T-SQL and it come up with a logical tree. At this phase, SQL Server even do not check if your table name that you passed in your query exists or not, because it's just trying to see if logically this query makes sense. 
Once that is passed, it will transfer it to the transformation phase. In that phase, query optimizer will produce equivalent variations of the tree. And when I say equivalent variations, what does that mean? It means all these trees should produce the exact result set. But to get to that result set, it can take different path. Once that is done, uh, you know, to give you an example, if you're doing a join between, say, like five tables, you can do the join in different ways. There's actually two to the power n number of combinations that you can come up with. Once that is done, SQL Server passes it to cardiality estimation, and that's the you know point of our talk today. So what happened in this phase? In this phase, cardinality estimator estimates the number of rows flowing through each operator in each tree. And based on those numbers, it put a cost for each operator. And all those costs within a plan get added. Next, it goes to the compare cost. So now we have a bunch of logical trees. Every tree got a estimate of their cost. So those costs, those costs get compared and the lowest one wins. Once it is chosen that which one it's, you know, is the lowest cost, and if this is the first time uh, you submitted this query and you are getting a new plan, it will get into plan cache. Why it goes into plan cache? So next time you submit the same query, it doesn't have to go through this first five phases. It will straight go to the execution phase. And you know, why is plan get evicted from the cache? Uh, what time uh, a query can decide to, you know, to, to go through these phases again, uh, a recompilation? Uh, you know, those have other reasons that, uh, that you can look up. That's not the, you know, uh, in scope of this talk. Now, once a plan get cached, then it goes to the execution phase. Now, imagine something goes wrong in that phase when the cardinality estimator was estimating the number of rows. What will happen? Your costs are not accurate, and you are putting probably a less efficient plan in the cache. And till this one get recompiled or get evicted, every time you call, you are really running a suboptimal plan. How do SQL Server decides that I already have a plan for this query that you submitted? Uh, it based on the hash. Uh, so, you know, it builds a num uh, hash uh, for every query that it comes in and it saves the plan uh, tied to a query hash. So next time you come in, it will check if it matches with the hash number. It's, oh, I have a query for you, a plan already in the cache. It's going to get that query plan and it will go straight to the execution phase. So if we have a bad plan, we get slow query, excessive resource get, uh, or, 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 you know, or less resource get assigned to that query, uh, to that execution plan. And then the order of operations are not correct. And then we have you know, all kinds of problems. And at the end, our throughput get reduced. And the, uh, so let's, let's look at some of the effects. So the first one, we're talking about whether my query is going to get executed in parallel or in a serial fashion. So there are two settings in SQL Server we call max stop. That's telling us if a query goes to parallel, how many schedulers or how many CPU a individual operator can get maximum to execute this plan in parallel. There's also another setting we call cost threshold of parallelism. That value tells us if your query cost goes beyond this number, then only you can go parallel, otherwise you will execute serial in serial fashion. So if our estimates are wrong and we have a wrong cost, this thing can flip, right? A parallel plan can go to serial, serial plan go, can go to parallel, which is not desirable, right? Because if you have a serial plan, which is optimal for a serial plan, now it goes parallel, it's taking more schedulers, so other queries will suffer from that. Same thing can happen in memory. So SQL Server need a memory grant if you have a sort, if you have a hash 
uh, join and you need to create a hash bucket, uh, SQL Server prefers to do those in memory. And SQL Server requests for memory grant, once the, there's a minimum memory you get assigned, then only that query can move. And there are two values, one is a minimum and one is what is the optimal memory grant that I want so I can do everything in the memory. And if you don't get it, then what happened? The sort or the hash operations, uh, they spill to disk. Now, well, some of you might say, oh, you know, TempDBs are fast, we have SSDs and uh, and whatnot, but it's still you're talking about microsecond versus millisecond. So you definitely want this to happen in your memory. So now if you also assign less memory, you spill to disk. If you assign more, then the subsequent queries will be suffering from memory grant. Access method. SQL Server can access data by a seek or a scan or a combination of seek plus a scan. They're all based, uh, you know, depends on your uh, query estimate or, or, or the number of rows estimate. So again, it has the implication. Uh, what kind of join? So, you know, we say, you know, inner join in our query, but physically SQL Server can do different kind of joins. There are three different kind of physical join, nested loop join, hash join, merge join. And in, um, in 2019, there's something called adaptive join, which is a combination of nested loop join uh, and hash join. So this will also depend on your, your, your cardinality estimation. Um, aggregates. Do I do a stream aggregate or do I do a hash aggregate? Um, that also depend on the, the number of rows plus also if your data is sorted or not. Uh, we already talked about sort. So whatever you see in this screen, everything get affected by the cardinal estimator. So let's look at uh, some of the reasons, right? Uh, Murphy's law is, you know, something will go wrong Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> so this is a, you know, this is a picture of that. So things will go wrong. Like I said, you will not get a match 100% of the time between estimated number of rows and actual number of rows. But how frequently it goes wrong and why it goes wrong, uh, it's good to know. Uh, so I gave you a couple of examples here. Missing statistics means, you know, I do not have an index or SQL Server did not create auto states for that. Stale statistics is it will always happen, you know, because we, if you have a OLTP system, you are constantly doing inside update deletes, but you are not going to update your stats for each update, insert, or delete because that's just not practical. So if you updated your stats now, then during you know during your business hour, there's a bunch of operations going on. As you make more changes, and SQL Server do track those, right? Your modification counters, uh, your stats will get stale. I talked about histogram steps and the sample rate. So that's another reason, uh, maximum 200 steps. Parameter sniffing. To give you an example, you walk into your doctor's office early in the morning, the, probably the server got rebooted. Uh, what do they ask you first? Your last name and your date of birth. And then that query get you know compiled and your plan get into cache. And so that query will get compiled with my last name and my date of birth if I'm the first customer. Now, in case of a patient, you probably, you know, you're probably, you know, at the reception desk, you're not looking at a bunch of customers. You're probably always looking for a single customer, so you might not see that. But imagine if you're looking for other data set uh, across the United States, you have a small cities, you have big cities. If you're looking for a, your first query was, you're looking for a small city, you pass that city name, and then you're looking for the same data for a bigger city where you have a large data population, then you have a problem, right? Because you compile with a smaller number of, uh, you know, rows that you, with your data set, and now you're looking for a huge data set. And, you know, everything I discussed in the previous slide now will come into effect. And then out of model query constructs, we'll see some of those, uh, you know, like multi-statement table valued function, table variable X query, uh, Microsoft is aware that you know these constructs does not estimate the, the the rows correctly for different reason, and it started in SQL Server 2017, and subsequently in 2019 with adaptive query processing and intelligent query processing, which was renamed from adaptive query processing. Microsoft is uh, putting a lot of effort to to improve on those, and um, I'm sure in past summit you will see there are talks about intelligent query processing. If you want to know more detail how out of model query constructs are being reconsidered again by Microsoft, and uh, they are you know, making improvements for cardinality estimation, 
uh, try to attend uh, one of those talks. Uh, there are about seven items uh, that has been done uh, up to SQL 2019. So as I said in my introduction, I'll be spending you know fair amount of time looking at uh, DBCC show statistics output because SQL Server primarily is looking at histogram uh, that are created with indexes or statistics that are created either manually or automatically. So sometime all SQL Server also use constraint information and logical rewrites of query to determine cardinality. So DBCC show statistics, if you look at it, uh, there are three different sections, a header, density vector, and histogram. I'm not going to read the definitions, but I put it here uh, for you. Once you download the slide, you can, um, you, know, you can review that. So in the header, of course, there are names, when it was last updated, number of rows, steps, because you can get maximum 200 rows, but you can also get less than 200. Do not use the deprecated density. There's another place you can use the density value. I'll show you that. Now, one interesting feature in this slide, if you look at the unfiltered rows, it says 7,595. And row sample is 50,299. Why is that? Also, you see something in the filter expression. There is a clause said contact person ID is greater than 2000. So this is a filter index, means saying only create index on this column where contact person ID is over 2000. So, and with that expression, there's only 50,299 rows qualified out of the total 73,595 rows. And I did a, you know, 100% uh, sample because this is a small table. So if you have a large table, and if you're not doing 100% sample, which is pretty normal, you can look at this and you know that, you know, what sample was used and how many rows uh, was considered while creating this index when it was last updated. Next one is a density vector. As I said in the previous slide, that do not use that density, use it from here. And it will create for your leftmost column and then it will move to the right. And for every combination of, you know, if you have like a three columns, um, it will do for the leftmost one and then the next two. And then for all the three, it also gives you average length uh, of those column combinations. The next is the histogram. So I took these two rows, as you see, they are, um, you know, put it in a red square. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger and try to explain this for you. As you can see here, on the top, I have two rows with a range high key for 2083 and 2091. So try to you know pay some attention, you know, close attention to this and make sure you understand these numbers. When I talk to people, uh, you know, in different meetings, in different user groups or question and answer, a lot of people is still uh, are confused what these numbers are really mean and how cardinality estimator, uh, you know, uh, interpolate and get numbers from this from this table. So, if I am passing a predicate value of 2083 or 2091, that is pretty easy for the cardinal uh, you know, to look up the number. It will straight come and look at the equal rows. So if I say the contact person ID is 20, 2083, it will select 119 rows. So that will be the estimate and that will be the uh, actual number also because I updated this stats with 100% sample. If it passes 2091, it's the same thing. It will uh, get to 106. But what happened if you pass anything in between? So if you pass 2084, 2085, 2086, something like that, what does the cardinality estimator do? The only piece of information the cardinality estimator had for those numbers, it only knows that I have three distinct range rows, means I have values for three of those IDs out of the seven. 
Now, which three? It has no idea. So, from 2084 to 2090, out of those seven numbers, for four, there is no record in this table. And for those seven numbers, there is total 332 records. How much for each one? No idea. And if we divide 332 by 3, that's the average range rows, which is 110 decimal 66. So, if you pass anything between 2084-2090, cardinality estimator will estimate 110 rows. So now you can see right off the bat that for four of those, there is zero rows, it will still estimate 110. For other three, I have no clue. Maybe two of those have one, one, and the other one has 330. But for all these seven SQL servers, it's going to estimate 110. Even though we did update stats with 100% sample. That is why I said at the beginning in my remarks that doesn't matter what you do, you will still get difference between estimate and actual. Now, once you see a discrepancy, you can come and look at it and you understand why that happened. And then, of course, there are a few things that probably you can do. And sometimes you cannot do anything with that. You just have to live with it. So that's pretty much I have for explanation. Uh, we'll move to demo. I'll talk about single predicate. Uh, when you have a direct hit to the histogram, uh, when you do not have a direct uh, hit, uh, SQL Server try to do some scaling. We'll uh, look at distinct. We'll also look at multiple predicates, conjunction, disjunction, miss, and, or, parameter sniffing, unknown and ascending key. And for my demo, I'm using SQL Server 2019 uh, CU8 and Management Studio 18.7, which was just released a few days ago. Uh, and so if you are following my code, um, uh, if you do not have these versions, it will still work because I'm going to control a lot of this uh, uh, in, in a different way that I'll show you that how you can mimic, uh, you know, behaving like 2017 or even like, you know, your earlier versions. Um, so, but I mostly tested with these two versions. So if you have any discrepancy, just keep that in mind that it's, a, you know, probably a version specific. And um, so let me set up demo and then I'll start there. So before all of you came online, I did run this uh, setup script, which I'm not going to run again for now to save some time. I downloaded the wide world importers database backup from GitHub. And then I also have instruction how you can restore it. And I also change the compatibility level to 140, which is the default compatibility level of SQL Server 2017. If you do not know what is compatibility level, I will highly urge you to look it up. That's the only way you can control a database default behavior, uh, especially in terms of cardinality engine or query optimizer, uh, because when you go to move cloud, there is no concept of SQL Server major version. You do not have SQL Server 2014, 16, 17, or 19. The only way you can control the default behavior is by compatibility. Where Microsoft is heavily pushing even the the, the you know the ISPs to move to compatibility level certification. So I did that here uh, because there's some 2019 has some improvement with adaptive query processing and intelligent query processing. Uh, which change some of the behaviors, especially the special constructs that I talked about, like table variables and uh, user-defined functions. And I'll, I'll show some of those during the demo. I also did update stats, so we have a fresh copy. So let's keep that aside. And then I also wrote another script which generates some of the DBCC show statistics numbers. So the reason I did this, right, when you look at the details of a statistics from index, we look at all these numbers and people think, you know, these are all magic numbers. You know, where are these numbers coming from? They think it's some deeper calculation within the engine that we have no idea. So to break that myth, what I did, I took some of these numbers and generated this by writing T-SQL. So if we run this 
whole thing right now, you can see that some of those numbers, eight out of all those numbers are generated right in T circle. What I'm trying to prove here that these numbers are not magic numbers, they're not unknown, that we have no clue, that we don't know what it is. Uh, you can definitely generate those numbers by yourself. Um, so, you know, look at this T sequence. I just use union all. And uh, once you go through this, you should have a pretty clear idea of what I'm doing. And if you get confused, please uh, reach out to me and I'll try to, you know, explain to you again uh, via a question and answer. So the first one we're going to talk about is a single predicate. And what I mean by that, if I'm passing a single predicate, there is no join from a single table. So as I said in the instruction, I'm going to take this and run this in a different window so we can refer to this when we are looking at numbers. Now in most of my demos, I am going to turn on actual execution plan. In SQL Server, there are two different kind of execution plan. One is estimated and one is actual. You can turn those on by there is a button here. Also, you can use a shortcut. Control L will give you estimate execution plan. Control M gives you actual execution plan. The difference between these two in the actual execution plan, you do have the runtime stats, which you do not have in estimated execution plan. And if you are not familiar with the execution plan, I will highly suggest you to read this book authored by a gentleman named Grant Fritchie. He's a longtime uh, data platform MVP, works for Redgate. He's also a past board member. He has a book of 800 plus pages that Redgate sponsored and it's free to download legally a PDF copy. That's one of the best resources I uh, noticed uh, about execution plan. So let's go through this. I'm going to turn on actual execution plan and I'm doing a select for contact person ID for 1025. If we run this, and if we look at the tooltip here, we can see the estimated number of rows, 89, and actual number of rows, 89. So in this case, we have a perfect match. As I said during my presentation of the slides, that sometimes we'll get it, sometime we will not get it. So what happened in this case? As soon as we submit it and it went to the query estimation phase, it sees that I have an index on contact person ID and it tried to look at the histogram. So, and it comes to down here for 1025. And look at the equal rows, the number is 89. So this is a perfect match in this case. So it was pretty easy for the cardinality estimator. It went and matched um, the number 89. Now, what will happen if we insert a bunch of rows with a similar contact person ID 1025? SQL Server does not update statistics for each insert, update, or delete. There are certain thresholds, as I said before. Once it matches those, it will update stats automatically or you can do it manually. So let's, but it is still try to do some kind of compensation and that's called scaling the estimate. So if we try to insert about 2000 plus rows with the same contact person ID, 1025, and now we go and go back, look at our stats, is a 73,595 rows, last update was 124 p.m. Now, if we run this again, we can see it's the same value, means it didn't get updated. But now, if we run the same query, after we clear the cache, and don't do it in production, I'm just doing it for demo purpose, and I'm doing it at a database scope, not at a server level. We run the same query. Now, if we look at this, of course, our actual number of rows are a lot higher than 89 because we inserted all those rows. But if we look at the estimated number of rows, it goes to 92.3365. So where is this 92.3365 number came from? This is the formula. 
it look at the old rows divided by the total number of rows and then multiply by the current number of rows and that's how you get this number so if you ever see that you have a direct hit but you're still not getting the same number this is the reason just so you know that so i'm going to put things back the way it was before we started the demo for the subsequent demos the next one what we're going to do we'll use the same query but for contact person id i'm going to use a different number which is not a direct hit in the histogram so it will be a number that in between and we'll look at how that number got generated i did explain it when i was showing you the histogram hopefully you got it but let's look look at it in action so this time we get 118.6667 so how do you do it? this number got generated if we come here and go down here just look at this number it was 1057 so 1057 is between these two Ten fifty-five and ten sixty-three. As I explained before, anything in between from ten fifty-six to ten sixty-two, it only knows that there is total three hundred fifty-six rows, and we have three distinct rows. So three fifty-six divided by three is this number. So anything you pass in between ten fifty-five and ten sixty. 3 will get this 1118.6667 even though some of those numbers if you query there is no data because that's the only information it has so let's try this with 1060 I really don't know how many rows are there for 1060 I haven't tried it so there's no rows but if we go here look at the estimate you still see that same number because it goes to the histogram and that's why I said there will be many occasions you will not be able to match the actual and the estimated numbers and you cannot do anything because that's the number it gets from histogram and histogram only has 200 steps for distinct SQL server can estimate the exact numbers so if we look at here Six sixty-three matches with the actual numbers. How did that happen? As I said, the density will be used in many many occasions. So here, one divided by the density, reciprocal of the density vector, which is six six two point nine, and it rounded up to six sixty-three. That's how we get these numbers. So next, we look at multiple predicates. So we did look at a single one. Now we're going to see if we are combining two predicates uh, what happens in this case I'm also going to do a range so here I'm looking at between these two and here I'm looking at between this two, and I'm going to combine those with the AND and OR clause here now before I do that you need to understand how this one get estimated numbers so here you're looking at a range from 1024 to 1027 and if we come here we can see that it will span these three numbers so anytime we are looking at a range that is not just uh, just two numbers from the histogram we are going to three or more the calculation is not as simple as what I was showing you in terms of single predicate so I put a huge note into the comment section. It actually breaks it into three, and then it get numbers differently for all three. This number two is simple, and even for number one and three, it has to look at two different things, and then it adds up all those numbers, and that's how it gets it. So I explained it into this. I also added two links from DBA Stack Exchange, where you will see more detailed answer. Uh, some of those were answered by Paul White uh, from New Zealand. Um, he is a master of this topic. So read through this, try to, you know, see how those numbers were made. And if you still have questions, please reach out to me. So I'm not going to explain this two separately. So we already assume that we know the cardinality of these two queries. Now we are going to put it together. 
Before I run this, I want to mention one thing. The cardinality estimation engine actually is a part of the query optimizer. And from SQL Server 7 up to SQL Server 2012, it used the same version of the of this engine. In 2014, it was rewritten and a lot of numbers got changed. So I'll try to show you both. There are ways that you can still mimic the old behavior and I'll show that too. So let me turn on actual execution plan. If I run this, so I should have chosen the right database. And now I did the end of both of the clauses. And if we look at this, we get estimated number of 44, whereas our actual number is 211. So where is the 44 came from? I put this formula for both versions. As you can see here, in 2014, it will be 44. If you're looking at pre-2014, it will be 4. So it's a lot closer to our actual numbers of 211. But does this guarantee that with the newer version, everything is going to get closer to the actual version? Probably not. Uh, if you, you know, play with it enough, I'm sure you can find out reverse example. That's why when you are testing, you should always, um, you know, test with your older version, update, and then do more testing. And if you read the Microsoft documentation or a blog post, especially if you're upgrading from 2012 to a newer version of 2014, 16, 17, and 19, there are certain ways that you can leverage query store, um, you know, to make sure that you find your regressed queries and you can work on those, uh, which is out of the scope of this talk. So now we are running the same query with the or statement. And if we look at here, our estimates are uh, 1404 decimal eight. How did this number got generated? Right here with the formula. And you know, this one there's not much difference, but it's still the newer version get closer to the actual number of rows. So what, what really changed? So in 2012 and previous version, the cardinality estimator, if there are multiple predicates, it will give the same weight. It didn't look at the selectivity and didn't do anything with the selectivity. But on the newer version, based on the selectivity, each number will get a different weight. As you can see in both of these cases, like the first one, I took it full. Then the next one, you make a square root. The next one, you make double square root. And then, you know, subsequently. So what you are trying, what it's trying to do is diminish the effect of those numbers that, you know, that didn't qualify for many rows. And that's why you will see the, see the numbers differ. Uh, in this comment section, what I did, I showed how you can run the same queries in the older version or make it behave like the older version. I put two different ways. One is the trace flag and one is a hint. Microsoft definitely encourage you to use hint and not use the trace flag. Uh, you can run those in your uh, you know, own time. I'm not going to run those just for the interest of time. So parameter sniffing is also another common problem um, with the SQL Server. Actually, so uh, and I explained it during my presentation that if you ran the query first time uh, with a single, uh, you know, with a population of a smaller city, that query get into the cache. Then you come and run the same query where the population population is a lot larger. You will have a problem because your query plan got cached with the smaller number. So you probably, you know, your joint type, your other stuff that I showed you, your access method and all that was dependent on those small number of uh, data set. And now you are running the same query using the same execution plan, but your data set is a lot bigger. You have these issues and how you solve that problem. There are many ways depending on the situation and I'm not gonna talk about this, but how do you identify that you have this problem? That's, I can show you right here. So I'm going to create a store procedure, very simple select a statement with a contact person ID. And so I've created this. And I'm going to execute this with a contact person ID of 1025. And we have seen 1025 a few times already. So we probably already know that, you know, what number you're going to see here. So our estimated number of rows are 89. And actual also 
89, right? We know that. It went, first time we executed, went to the histogram, looked at it, bingo, it's 89. Now, if I run the same query without recompiling, means using the same execution plan with 1057. Now, we looked at 1057 before. 1057 is supposed to be 118.6667, but let's see what happened here. We did not get 118.6667, we got 89. Why? Let's look at property. If we look, that, look at the parameter list, the two things that you want to pay attention. This parameter was compiled with 1025 because that's the first time we ran the store proc with that value. But second time, we ran it with 1057. So our runtime value is 1057. So when we ran it second time, it looked at the query, created a hash, and then find that this this hash matches with the pre you know with the plan in the cache with this plan because it's the same query just two different values. So it says yeah I'm going to reuse the plan, but problem is now I'm passing a different parameter value, and that's how you can you know identify that you have a parameter sniffing problem. Look at the compile value and the runtime value. Now, how you solve it, like I said, you know, uh, search it, there are talks by, you know, other people. One thing people often do is to recompile, but, you know, that's not the only solution because if your query is running millions of times in an hour, probably not the right option. Um, so, again, you know, there are different solutions, different way you can solve this. So now, let's recompile this just for the sake of this demo, and I wrote this code if you use this, you can just recompile that one store procedure. You do not have to do it at a, at a database level. And you should not be doing it at a database level, especially in a production server during business hour. Now we did this. Now I'm running the same query with 1057. And this time, I'm expecting to see the right value, 118.6667. And if we look at this property, If we go to the parameter list, compile value, and the runtime value is same. So we do not have that problem right now because we just recompiled it um, and it created a new plan. So let's talk about some unknowns. I talked about a predicate can evaluate to true, false, or unknown. And so what happens when the value is unknown how do the cardinality estimator estimate the number of rows? Let's look at that. So let's get to the right database first. Now, in this case, order ID is a unique column. If you look at the table definition, so the estimator is smart enough, it can take advantage of it. It knows that, you know, it's a unique. So it just estimate one row and actual number is one row. Even though I'm passing it as a variable, you see no issues. But if I do the same for contact person ID, which is not unique, what happened? I get this number, 111.003. We of course know from previous examples that there is Sorry, that's the wrong one, not the number of rows. Right? The actual number of rows for our execution is 89. Because at the compile time, it doesn't have any idea what value is passed for CPID variable. So it used the density and total number of rows, and that's where this number comes from. That's why I said you know, density will be used in many, many places. Now, if we take an example of a table variable, if we run this, we see that estimated number of rows per execution is one, but of course actual number of rows are higher. Now if I take recompile this, 
that a SQL Server can see what's in the table variable, we get a different number, 271.284. Now, don't think that, you know, because you are recompiling, the table variable suddenly get stats at column level or anything. That doesn't happen. It's a hard-coded number, and I'll show you that. But before I do that, I want to make a point that I said before, that with compatibility level, now if I force this database to act like 2019 in terms of query engine, I can run the same query without the compile, recompile, and we'll still get the number that we saw with compile with the older compatibility level, right? I get 271.284. And I'll show you where this number is coming from. So it's a hard coded number. From 2014, what it does, it takes the total number of rows, it raises it to the power of 0.5. In pre 2014, it was you know, raised to the power of 0.75. Again, this one is a lot closer, but again, there's no guarantee, right? As I said. Now, as I, you know, do not assume again, and I want to make this point clear, table variable, even in 2019, the numbers do change because of this change, um, you know, uh, but you do not get a, a table level um, statistics or anything. And if you, you know, in your table variable, if you pass a filter with 1025, of course, you know, you're going to get the exact number here with 89 and 89, because it knows that it only has the 89 number of rows, you know, and it's not searching for the whole, you know, in, in all the rows. I'm going to change this back to 140, just for the, continue the demo. So I'm going to look at a couple more examples here. I'm declaring a variable, passing 1014, but and I'm using all kind of inequality uh, signs, right? Greater than, less than, less than or equal, greater than or equal. And in all of this, you will see that the estimated number will be same. And the reason is this, because it's hard coded. So that's the number, 22,078.5. For all this, because it's thirty percent of the total rows, and you cannot do anything, you cannot change. You know that's how it is. If you're using a like operator, it's going to be nine percent. Uh, if you are using a between, it's for twenty fourteen plus is sixteen point four three one seven. For uh, pre twenty fourteen, it's nine percent, and these are hard coded again. Uh, so I can show you this. These are the numbers. So if we run this, and if we look at the estimated numbers, uh, you will see the difference. So here we get 12,092. And here you get 6,623.5. with these numbers. So the last one I'm going to talk about is ascending key, which is uh, another common problem. If you have a table that's continuously appending rows at the bottom, or if you have a date time, you get into this problem. And the reason you get into this problem, because SQL Server, as I said, it doesn't get updated stats for every rows that you insert, update, or delete. So if you have data that goes beyond the max number, um, it has a hard time to, to estimate, right? So let's take a look at this example. So we know we have 73,595 rows, and this is a query that you can look what kind of stats you have in this table. So you're going to pick one of these, uh, this one, because this goes with the date time, which is easier to show you in the demo. So in this one, we see that our max value is from 2016, May 31st. Now we're going to insert about 50 rows with 2017, which 
we do not have into that uh, in, in that statistics right so in that histogram actually before we do that let's run this in a different window so it's easier for us to look at it's 2016 March 31st we'll be inserting rows with 2017 so inserted 50 rows let's look at this it's we can see that we have 50 more rows but if we run this this is still 2016.05 so it didn't get updated now if we query for those rows that we just inserted what will happen we know that we inserted 50 rows that's for sure but our estimated number of rows are 34.6329 where does that come from again there's a formula it's for 2014 34 but it's pre 2014 it was always one there is no way to know it was hard coded to one so in 2014 uh, you know it, they made it a lot better so if you're still using an older version there's two trace flag 2389 and 2390 uh, this might help you so look it up and uh, you know uh, if you read those about those two trace flags I also have a link in the reference slide uh, can help you but in 24 in this you know, much improvement was done even though your update is you know stats doesn't get updated you still get some benefit uh, of count of the new rows so that's the end of the demo uh, I am going to show you some of the references that I listed here they are all uh, URL behind the scene you can click on those and go to uh, you know individual articles or documentation from Microsoft uh, these are some of the resources that I also used and read when I was preparing this and I thank you very much again for attending this session uh, take a note of my contacts uh, uh, I also have email in this slide if you are prefer to send email Twitter or LinkedIn that I showed you before and um, we'll open up for question and answer in the chat window and I'll monitor those again uh, you can download all the slides and the demo code from past summit website it's already been uploaded there feel free to download share it use it uh, thank you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit